Okay, so carrying on with the possible series of thoughts on dot, 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 let's look at Noah, uh, the Noah Torah portion. Uh, and I've called this a prophecy of the end times. Um, now, let me go out and say this straight away. Today is not what I would maybe call doctrinal. Uh, this is more shooting the breeze, let's speak openly. Um, do you know what I mean? So, so some of the things that people don't normally talk about, while well, they do in some circles, in some circles it's all they talk about, but, you know, let, let's just speak casually. You know, we're, we're allowed to ponder on things and sometimes even be wrong in our pondering, but like I said, this is what I'm calling this thoughts on. This is just what I've got to think about these things I hope you find it interesting. When it decides to do its thing. There we go. So in Matthew 24, Yeshua says, And as the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be, the Son of Adam be. For as they were in the days before the flood, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until that day, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. And so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man, of the Son of Adam. Then two shall be in one field, the one is taken and the one is left. Two shall be grinding at the mill, one is taken, one is left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your master is coming. So this is why I've called today's thing, Noah, a prophecy of end times. Because Yeshua is saying that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. Which means we can actually glean a lot from this Torah portion, prophetically speaking. Now the first clue we can glean from this is that it's business as usual for the rest of the world. Yeshua says, eating, drinking, being merry. So no post-apocalyptic landscape going on. That doesn't happen until the wrath, um, right at the end of the tribulation. We can actually also glean what the spiritual condition of the rest of the world will be in the end times. And we do that from actually looking at the story of Noah. It says in Genesis 6, 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, the men of name. And Yah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, what is the definition of evil? transgression of the law, Torahlessness. So people think, ah, oh, these were like raping, murdering savages. And it's like, no, they were just constantly sinful. Everything on their mind was sinful. You know, there's people out there that are not in covenant and sin is not continually on their mind. Because we all know people like that. You know, good people. Good people, they're just not in covenant. So we're not quite there yet, but take a look around and you can see it going that way very quickly. You know, especially, oh yeah, I won't get into it. <laughs> now verse four is also interesting in that there were Nephilim on the earth, which implies the same thing occurring during the end times. So again, look guys, you guys know I'm not one for sensationalism or staying within quote unquote conspiratorial um, sort of topics, but let's address this for what it is, you know. Um, you know, we've got to address it at some point. So again, we're shooting the breeze on these things. So how does the quote-unquote return of the Nephilim, how could it occur? So first of all, what were the Nephilim? Huh? Tall men. Tall men. <laughs> well, that's one. So there were the results of Angels coming down, mating with women, okay? And they created abominations that were never supposed to exist. So that's what, an, I would say, that's one of the things that a Nephilim is. It, it wasn't part of Yah's plan. He knew it would occur, but he didn't plan for it, right? So they're abominations. 
They're not even supposed to be here. I would argue they were not created in the image of Elohim as well. They were created in their image after man and a fallen angel's image. So, again, it's an abomination. So how is this going to come round again? So again, these are my thoughts, guys. This is not doctrine. Like I said, these are my personal speculations, but they're also the ones of many others. Um, you know, we, we like to discuss these things every now and then. Um, yeah. So what are we being conditioned and desensitized to? Because that's what I believe the primary role of your TV is for. It's to, it, it programs you, so to speak. Um, who's um, heard the, this sort of idea that Yah says everything that he's going to do beforehand and that the enemy has to play by the same rules? So they put things out there, but they just shroud it in, so that it's not to those who don't have eyes, you know. But now, I say unfortunately, now it's becoming more and more where it's not being hidden. They're not even bothering, and we'll see this. So superhero movies. Look, I'm a, I used to really enjoy superhero movies, and I'm going to be honest, I still enjoy them. I don't watch them, but it, it's really annoying because I know I shouldn't like it because I know what it points to, but a man likes a good action movie sometimes, right? So, yeah, there you go. I, I, I'm not a holy man, right? I'm not your holy man. I'm just another guy. But let's look at some common themes in superhero movies. The son of a god coming to save mankind. So I've put in the picture here Thor. Thor is the son of Odin. You know, Odin was the great god of the Vikings. I don't want to get too much into the law. The son of a god coming to save, wrong god, wrong son. Superman, if those of you who don't know, but in, in the movie, in, in the comics and stuff, his real name is Kal-El, which literally means the voice of God. The word of God, right? Think about this. Coming from another planet, like, it, it, when you start breaking these things, you're like, oh my goodness, what are they trying to put into your mind? They usually involve a saviour coming from a different planet or world. Usually. Or just a saviour, whether it be from another world, or even a, a, a man. Putting your trust in a man. A hero coming to being as the result of genetic manipulation. That's another thing you see, like, this freak accident changed them. And I would argue, I'd lean to this idea, it's changing man from the image of Elohim into something else. It's corrupting the image that Yah created it to be. Now, a little homework will tell you that modern superheroes are just repackaged and modernized Greek myths. And the people who come up with these stories and comics are not shy of admitting that either. They'll tell you straight up, oh yeah, we got the inspiration from this Greek myth and that one and this one, and we just kind of modernized it. They're not shy to admit that. Many films and series contain Egyptian and Greek mythology. Um, what's the series called? It's like a sci-fi one. Uh, Stargate. Stargate, and like they, they go to these different worlds, and the, the way they've got the, the Egyptians is that um, it was this interplanetary race, and these were this race were worshipped as the Egyptian gods. You know, and that's just one instance of it. But again, they're like repackaging ancient mythos and modernizing it for the consumer. Now, what's interesting is Josephus tells us that the Titans and the Greeks of myths were, in fact, Nephilim. He openly says it. Oh, yeah, you know, the Titans and the, uh, of, that the Greeks speak of and that, those were the Nephilim. He, he had, that, that was the belief in the first century. These were the men of renown. So the reason I bring this up is when, if you understand that all this stuff is just repackaged Greek myths, and you realize that the Greek myths were actually based off Nephilim, then that should make you think, hmm. Should at least make you think twice. All these programs desensitize us to superhuman individuals, which either come from other worlds or are genetically enhanced somehow, or different, right? 
and it's becoming more and more and more. I, I remember being like thinking back to when I was a kid because I used to love superheroes. And if a superhero would have appeared back then, I believe that everyone would have been like, whoa, right? I believe that if one was to appear now, people would go, it's about time. Because this is where people's minds are at. Now, a lot of these programs involve good versus evil themes where a great battle has to be fought and won. Almost every single superhero movie, there's a good guy, there's a bad guy, ding, ding, right? Round one. <laughs> Sometimes they milk it and it's like a whole series. Now, these battles, I found that they usually won when these superhuman beings and humanity cooperate together in a lot of them. Really interesting. It's like, hmm cooperate with these beings, right? Now, is superhero themes being pushed in our media? Like, when I was young, there was a few superhero movies. Now, like, all these big companies, they've got, like, ten films in, the, in waiting to be released, right? And they're already releasing... The, they're making ridiculous amounts of money, but this is being pushed, this is really being pushed. Like, you get several films a year, all based around superheroes. When I was a kid, you get one every few years. So there's definitely a, a ramp up. Oh, well, let's go there, okay? Like I said, these are speculations, and you guys know I really don't like going in this territory too much. But you've got to tackle it every so often, because it's in the Noah portion. Um, again, beings from another planet, okay? That's what I'm referring to. Now, these beings usually have knowledge that can supposedly help us transcend our current condition, right? Does that, do people know what I mean by that? Like, you'll find a lot of new age uh, sort of personalities. And I'm not talking about complete whack jobs here. I'm talking about people that have a big following. These people, are, through whatever crazy stuff they get up to, they claim they've had interactions with either interdimensional beings and so it's like there's one famous guy says he was contacting aliens from the Pleiades, right? And that these beings, they've got, they, they know that we've got what it has for you to transcend, for you to become better than what you are. Who knows who Alistair Crowley is? <laughs> yeah. Alistair Crowley was really known for his occult rituals. He's known as the, the man of the occult. Uh, now, he did these things called the Alamantra workings of 1918. And during the, the whole purpose of it was to invoke entities from other dimensions. Um, this was done through ritual sex magic. He, he's not shy about it either. He, he's written about it. He kindly left us a drawing of the entity he was communing with. And it was this guy. This is 1918, before there's any sort of idea of aliens, okay? This was 1918. Uh, just for perspective, this whole thing of aliens came around in the late 1940s, just after World War II. So there's quite a big gap. Um, now, Crowley then published this in regards to this entity, and he claimed this entity was called Lam. Lam is the Tibetan word for way or path. Now, who does scripture say is the way, the truth, and the life? Yeshua. And Lama is he who goeth, the specific idol of gods of Egypt. So again, this idea of Egyptian law coming in, the treader of the path. But again, a counterfeit way, a counterfeit path. We've been given a way and a path. And this is in uh, complete opposition to it, actually. Now, the link between the occult, the New Age, and so-called aliens is undeniably huge. You'll find it all together. I put aliens in inverted commas because I don't believe there is such a thing. I believe it's demonic. Yeah, and actually, speaking of this, people have actually, those that have been courageous enough to actually study people who claim to have been abducted by aliens, they found striking similarities between demonic possession and manifestations of re in religious worlds. And these were people that are non-believers, actually, that conducted these studies. And they just realized, hang on a minute, why are we seeing all the same things in these two things? 
I think those with a biblical worldview would understand that. Again, is alien media being pushed by society? Yeah. I mean, if it isn't superheroes, which are, some of which are technically aliens, um, it's, it's like uh, supernatural things. It, it, three things being pushed in the media, aliens, superheroes, occultism. I believe that occultism tells you what these, the other two are. This type of media, again, it desensitizes us to the idea of otherworldly beings. Imagine if, quite like, aliens show up, say, 50 years ago, people would have freaked out. They would have absolutely freaked out. If it happened today, people, again, what will they say? Oh, it's about time. People wouldn't be shocked. I mean, they'd be shocked and surprised, but they, they, they wouldn't just lose it. More often than not, this media comes from the conspiratorial quote-unquote truther movement. This is really big in like the darker corners of the internet, shall we say. Another common theme to these phenomenon is that of harvesting genetic material, which links us back to your superhero themes, okay? Again, I will bring this background. You're probably thinking, where are you going with this? Is there a move in the modern world that would pave the way for quote-unquote superheroes and fit the bill in regards to genetic manipulation of humankind? Is there people wanting this? And I would argue absolutely yes. I don't even have to argue it. Who's heard of transhumanism? Yeah. It's a global scientific effort to quote-unquote upgrade humanity through the use of technology, DNA manipulation, and it's either done by manipulating the DNA itself or borrowing from animals. Now, the people behind this movement are not actually whack jobs. They're some of the world's leading scientists in their respective fields. I mean, we're talking some of the smartest men on the planet, and they're all pushing the quote-unquote evolution and transcendence of mankind. Hmm. You know, so again, I'm, I'm not going... For, and th this is out there, like... Now, their end goal is to help humanity transcend its current nature and eventually attain immortality. They openly admit this. That's, our, that's the end result. We want immortality. A counterfeit one. A counterfeit one. Who's heard of this? The 2045 initiative. So th this is actually one of the companies that's led again, by some of the leading scientists in the whole world. Leading scientists. And these are their goals. So when they, when they, you know, a robotic copy of a human body remotely, do we have robots right now in like, that have been produced that are very clever? They've already made them. Go look at what Japan have been up to. They've created humanoid robots that can run across any kind of terrain. Uh, and they do it effortlessly, and they can actually do it better than humans. And then they want eventually an avatar in which you can plug your brain in. So once you die, let's pop your brain in this robot. And then after that, in 2035, 2030 to 35, never mind the brain, let's just upload your personality into it. Now, I know this sounds like really far-fetched and science fiction, but they're actually going for this. Like, there's, <laughs> there's people right now, some of, one of these scientists has actually got a chip in his brain that's actually widened his sensing capacities. He can sense electrical stuff. Like, it's actually widened his field of senses. <laughs> now, obviously, all of this has been done under the noble goal of furthering the human race, right? I actually believe that this plays a part into this passage. Uh, in Revelation 9, we have the pit of the deep being opened and locusts coming out. Um, let me drop down. Locusts come up onto the earth. Uh, authority is given to them. It was said that they should not harm the grass or any green matter, but only those men who do not have the seal of Elohim upon their foreheads. Um, and then it says they've got authority to torture them for five months, but uh, they can't kill them. It says that they should not kill them. Now, this is the verse that I'm getting to. In those days, men shall seek death and shall not find it. 
and they shall long to die, but death shall flee from them. If you want to seek death, go stand in, go stand in the motorway, right? <laughs> or the freeway for the Americans. Um, go, go, go jump in front of a train. You'll soon find death, right? Go stick your finger in a plug socket. Men are seeking it. it you almost get this idea that, look, that they shall flee. It, death shall flee from them. That's like they're, they're trying their best. How is that possible? I don't know. I'm just shooting the breeze here, guys. I'm shooting the breeze. If counterfeit immortality seems beyond grasp, this passage should be ringing in our ears right now. And this is part of the Torah portion, actually. Then Yah came down to see the city. This is speaking of Babel and this tower which the sons of men had built. And Yah said, look, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. And now they are not going to be withheld from doing whatever they plan to do. Other translations will list it as, now they're all together, they'll be able to, what they've thought of, they'll be able to achieve it. Now again, this movement of transhumanism is led by the world's leading scientists. If you go to that 2045 website and go to, uh, they've got a talk going on, they've got this uh, conference going on. Go look at who's speaking at the conference. They've got 30 odd scientists there and these guys are like cream of the cream, like leading faculty scientists of MIT, of big corporate companies. <laughs> anyway. This organization seeks to achieve their goals through the integration of humanity with technology. So that 2045 initiative, they're going down the technology road. There's other scientists, I've not included it for the sake of time, they're seeking to do it with, with animal DNA manipulation. They've, they've openly admitted on the news that they've been able to successfully fuse human and pig embryos. Now, they say that they terminate them. This is what they're letting you know, okay? Just throwing it out there. There's a guy called like Nick Bolstrom or Nick Brace. I can't remember his name. English guy. Um, and he openly admits, yeah, we want to get the DNA from this animal and that. Imagine having the sonar of a dolphin. You know, that's the way they're speaking at the minute. Interestingly, this 2045 company, they have an interfaith dialogue branch to the organization. Why? They've, they've got the guy who leads the Orthodox Church in America. They've got this religious guy from uh, Buddhism. They've got all these bigwigs uh, in religion, and the idea is that is religion compatible with their ideology? And these religious leaders are saying, yes, it is. They're actually saying it's part of the, you know, the, the grand will, as it were. It's like, and what's interesting is some of these scientists in this thing actually treat transhumanism as a religion. They have like an ethos. They have a belief system. They'll openly admit that they want, one of the guys says that if they can achieve immortality, they'll be like gods. And they say this in interviews. It's, it's crazy. Are we seeing the way being paved for such a future? This was written in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Florida man becomes the first person to live with an advanced mind-controlled robotic arm. They'd been testing the arm for about uh, eight years before this, testing it, working with him. Um, but he, this article, he was allowed to take the arm back home and live with it. Go watch the videos, search this guy here, Johnny Matheny. Six yeah, six million. Well, actually, the arm is 120 million, yeah. quite a bit more. But I, I watched the videos, and this guy can control this artificial limb with his mind. He can pick up balls, he can pick up tokens. He was holding his wife's hand with it. So, like, I mean, again, this is what we're allowed to be privied to. But th this is like science fiction happening before our eyes. I remember being little thinking this stuff was impossible. So we're talking within 20 years. 
Now, this was part of a 10-year project funded by the U.S. Defense Department. <laughs> What's the U.S. Defense got to do with a guy with a missing limb, right? Why would the U.S. Defense... Anyway, I believe that everything mentioned so far... Okay, now let's bring this all back to Scripture, okay? Uh, like I said, I don't like to live in sensationalism. It's been used... Everything that I've mentioned is pointing us to one moment in the future... And that's Revelation 12, verse 7. And they came to be fighting in the heaven. Uh, Michael and his messengers fought against a dragon, and the dragon and his messengers fought. But they were not strong enough, nor was there a place found for them in the heaven any longer. And the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who leads the world astray. He was thrown down to the earth, and his messengers were thrown out with him. Just think that, remember that Hasatan was the pinnacle of Yah's creation. And he gets thrown down to earth. I believe that Hasatan knows what is coming and has prepared the way for his arrival. Simple as that. What, what would the world think if a supernatural entity like Hasatan just showed up one day? <laughs> what would they think in this current day and age? They'd either think alien, superhero, all of the above, saviour, yeah. All the new age guys would be saying, see, we told you. <laughs> what do you think the arrival of the most powerful created being, a, a, a powerful created being, okay, please note that, and his cronies, what do you think them arriving would actually look like? I'm not saying try and bring up this fanciful image, but... It's going to be pretty astonishing. Like, really astonishing. I personally believe that if Hasatan showed up, we would think that, that like, Yeshua or someone showed up. Because, you know, he appears as an angel of light, right? What do you think most people would consider him to be if he showed up with all his power? Maybe even a god? They'd, oh yeah, they'd worship him, absolutely. For Satan himself masquerades as a messenger of light. If, if Hasatan was to show up, that like, people's mind are already like, they want something like this to happen. They actually want something like this to happen. And with the aid of transhumanism, he can almost say, well, you can be like me too. <laughs> Let's upgrade you. Anyway... Does that make sense? Again, I'm just shooting the breeze, guys. Like, again, this is not doctrine. I'm willing... This is campfire talk. But again, Yeshua said, as in the days of Noah, there were Nephilim then. What does that look like today? That's where I'm coming from. So again, as the days of Noah, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two shall be in the field. One is taken, the one is left. Two shall be grinding at the mill. One is taken and one is left. This is the passage, or one of, used for a pre-trib rapture. You know, oh, two at the meal, one's gone, and they imagine, you know, almost like, beam me up, Scotty, you know. And then for seven years, the Jews get smashed by, the, anyway, that's um, replacement theology and all that. In the flood account, who was taken? Well, it was the unbelievers, yeah, the people, the people. Noah was protected. Noah didn't suddenly get whizzed up to the sky. I believe, well, uh, the, the Kituvim give us an answer. In Proverbs 2.20 it says, So walk in the way of goodness and guard the paths of righteousness. For the straight shall dwell in the earth and the perfect be left in it. They shall be left in it. You know, so, do, do you want to be left behind sort of thing? But the wrong shall be cut off from the earth and the treacherous ones plucked out of it. It almost sounds like the opposite of the rapture, doesn't it? Of what's being preached out there as the rapture. Yeah, well, actually, that's where I'm going now. Psalm 37. For evildoers are cut off, but those who wait on Yah, they shall inherit the earth. Not heaven. Yet a little while and the wrong one is no more, and you shall look on his place, but it is not. So it's the wicked that will be no more. 
the meek ones shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in plenty of peace. But the wrongdoers shall perish, and the enemies of Yah, like the splendor of the meadows, they vanish. Like smoke, they vanish away. Now, what do you get in these rapture sort of themes? That people are, you, you get these pictures of like a pile of clothes left on the floor. <laughs> you don't want to vanish, according to Psalm 37. For his blessed ones inherit the earth, but those cursed by him are cut off. For Yah loves right ruling and does not forsake his kind ones. They shall be guarded forever. But the seed of the wrongdoers is cut off. Noah was guarded. It actually says that Yah shut the ark with his hand. And he said, I will place my hand over it. He was guarded. The righteous shall inherit the earth and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. His, talk, his tongue talks of right ruling. I love this verse. The Torah of Elohim is in his heart. His steps do not slide. Isn't that like renewed covenant talk? David's writing this. And he's saying the righteous, the Torah of Yah is in his heart. So I believe it was possible pre-Pentecost, right? That's what I'm getting at. Wait on Yah and guard his way and he shall exalt you to inherit the earth. When the wrongdoers are cut off, you shall see it. I'm just saying this. Look, I'm sorry. Pre-trib rapture, you know. Back to the Torah portion. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yah. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with Elohim. Now the word there is tamim for perfect. And I really love what it says there. Innocent, having integrity. What is complete or entirely in accord with truth and fact. I, love, I really like that definition of the word. It's also used of the sacrificial lambs. They had to be to me. They had to be perfect. Now, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the son of Adam be. This means we can infer that there will be a remnant in the last days that are righteous and to me. There'll be a, but a remnant. There's only, well, it, it only says that Noah was righteous. By implication, his wife and his sons, maybe. But we know that Ham was a bit shady, right? We can also infer that they will have a knowledge of Torah. As Noah knew the difference between clean and unclean, and he walked with Elohim. The phrase to walk with Elohim, look, look, what does he say? Walk in the path. Walk in my commands. Guard the path. Do not go to the left, to the right. This is what it means to walk with him. Now, so, yeah. D does that sound familiar to today, though? There's only a remnant, really, and, and of that remnant that are keeping Torah. Now, Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. It came to be that after seven days, the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heavens were opened. Is it Genesis 7? Yes. Sorry. Genesis 7, guys. Oh, I thought I didn't get let one, let one slip. Now, this date is only significant if you think of second Passover. Um, we're all aware of what the second Passover is, right? Um, if you couldn't, it, when Passover came around, if you were defiled by a dead body or you were away on a long journey, uh, then you could take the second Passover. Those were the only criteria that could let you off, so to speak, the first Passover. It's, it's in Numbers 8 or Numbers 9, around there. Now, let's look at the timeline of Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection quickly, because I want to draw a parallel. This is Yeshua's timeline. So we have, obviously, Passover here, the crucifixion. He's buried at sundown here. So you have unleavened bread 1, to three, three days in the night and grave. And on first fruits is when he was risen. Now notice what the days are. Okay, day 14 is Pesach. 
unleavened bread begins on day 15. Now, in the case of Yeshua's time, because first fruits can move within the um, unleavened bread week, can't it? Because it's always on a Sunday. That Sunday can happen any time within the week. But in the case of Yeshua's crucifixion, it happened on day 18. It happened on day 18. Now, why is this important? It says here that the waters of the, of the flood, the fountains of the deep were broken on the, seven, in the second month on the 17th day. On the 17th day. So this would, because it said he was in the ark a week and then the flood waters came. Could it be that between the 17th and the 18th day of the second month that all of the people of the earth perish and that Noah and his family were waived as a first fruit offering on the 18th of the second month? Because it says that the flood waters started to rise. So imagine the ark being waved and they're the first fruits of what? The next stage of humanity. They're the only ones left. Let's quickly look at the, yeah, let's see the timeline again. So what I'm suggesting, now I'm suggesting this is second Passover, not first. It says on day 17, the fountains of the deep were broken. And that was the end of the seven days that they were in. What I'm suggesting is that all the people on the earth perished and drowned on that day. And that on day 18, Noah became a first fruits offering. I'm, I'm shooting the breeze, guys. I find it very compelling. I find it interesting. Is it doctrine? Probably not, right? But, again, when you see these connections, I can't help but think, hmm, right? I also believe the second Passover plays a significant role in end times prophecy. Now, we covered this at Sukkot, uh, this little section. Uh, so for those people online that were gutted, oh, we don't get to hear what was said at Sukkot, this is one of the things we talked about. We can say that Elohim works to his modi, right? Everything, that's his timepiece. That's uh, when he does things. Let's look at Revelation 9. So again, the fifth messenger sounded, so this is the fifth trumpet. I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the pit of the deep was given to it. He opened the pit of the deep, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. The sun was darkened, also the air, because of the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and authority was given to them, as the scorpions of the earth possess authority." We read this earlier, actually. Um, and it was said to them that they should not harm the grass of the earth or any green matter or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of Elohim upon their foreheads. And again, this is the verse I wanted to get to. It was given to them that they should not kill them, but to torture them for five months. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men shall seek death and shall not find it, and they shall long to die, but death shall flee from them. So this is now, you know, anyway, <laughs> picking up from earlier, right? The only way I can make five months fit around the Moedim is from the second Passover to the full Moedim. So between the spring feasts and the fall feasts, there is six months. And between the fall feasts and the spring feasts, again, there is six months if you don't have an intercalary month. The only way I can make five months fit around the Moedim is from second Passover. I believe we can make a strong argument for this when one thinks thematically. So let's think thematically. So Passover, the main themes really is protection from plagues and destruction through the blood of the Lamb. Now, who were the locusts not allowed to touch? Those who had the seal of Yah on their forehead. Now, the seal of Elohim on one's right hand and forehead comes up in the Passover a lot. This night shall be to you like a remembrance. Uh, cast your mind back to in the Blood of Yeshua series when we did the Blood on the Doorpost teaching. And in that teaching, we showed how the blood of the lamb and keeping the Torah and keeping his Moedim was the thing that protected you. It was his seal. 
Now again, the locusts, who can they not touch? Those with the seal of Yah on their hand and forehead, on their forehead, sorry. Again, only those men who do not have the seal of Elohim upon their foreheads. Now, again, I, would, I find it interesting that if we're thinking second Passover, we're still talking Passover themes here, just one month later. Noah was protected from calamity because he was righteous. Tamim, and he walked with Elohim. And what I would argue is that he had the seal of Elohim on his right hand and forehead, which we've already established is... It, many times, the Torah, the feasts, the Sabbath, the blood of the Lamb. Noah was righteous and he walked with Yah. And he was perfect. I believe that we can actually see the mercy of Elohim in the account of the flood and the judgment of the fifth trumpet. I believe it's actually an act of mercy that we see it in the second Passover. Because... Like I said, the second Passover was only afforded to those who were defiled by a dead body or away on a long journey. You weren't allowed to just make up an excuse of, oh, well, you know, there's the footy game on tonight and, you know, I'll just make it to second Passover. <laughs> no, 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 no. I believe that Elohim is giving every last minute possible for anyone to repent and take his seal of protection upon them. That's, again, my personal opinion. But it's in Yah's nature to do that, right? He's saying prophet after prophet after prophet. He, he could have just judged them before, you know, after one prophet. Right, you didn't hear the warning, tough. He sent them so many. I mean, we've got a scripture full of them, right? Everyone with me? See, that was one of the things we covered at Sukkot. Um, I also wanted to bring this up. It came to be the 600 year, the 601st year in the first month on the first day of the month that the waters were dried up from the earth. Wrong picture really to have for that. <laughs> and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and saw the surface of the ground was dry. Now on the Hebrew New Year, you have Noah removing the covering of the ark, thus letting light in. Okay, that's what you have. Now I really like this. Because um, this date is quite important in Israel's history. Exodus 40, Yah spoke to Moshe saying, On the first day of the month, you are to raise up the dwelling place of the tent of meeting. So they, the, the Israelites had been in the desert a year, or nearly a year at this point. And shall put the, in it the ark of the witness and screen the ark with the veil. And Moshe did according to all that Yah had commanded him, so he did. And it came to be in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, that the dwelling place was raised up. And the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the esteem of Yah filled the dwelling place. If you read the whole chapter, it just says that they put in the altar, they put in the table of showbread, they put in the lampstand. But this is what happened on Aviv 1. And Moshe was not able to come into the tent of meeting because the cloud dwelt on it and the esteem of Yah filled the dwelling place. So Noah takes the covering off the ark, allowing the light in. And on this same day, the light of the world technically comes down. Now, this is all I've got at the minute. I know there's something more. I just don't know what it is. So for all you Bible students out there. Okay, last section. Thoughts on Noah. Ooh, what will it be? <laughs> in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of the heavens were opened. And the waters were mighty on the earth, 150 days. Now in Genesis 8, it says that the waters receded steadily from the earth and at the end of the 150 days, the waters diminished. And then it says, when it, yeah, in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, the ark rested on, mount, on the mountains of Ararat. So that actually takes you to Sukkot now. The ark rested on Mount Ararat on 15, this third day of Sukkot. Which is interesting. So you could, I don't know, is he camping out? On, who knows? 
But what I want to note is that you have a five-month period being of 150 days. These verses show essentially a 30-day month, 360-day year calendar. If there's 12 months and it's 150 days for five months, 30 days in a month. Now, those of you who have looked at the calendar w- will understand that right now, even the, the, the lunar solar calendar that we follow, it's 29 point something, right? The length of a month, 29 point something days. Currently, this is not the case. However, prophecy requ- revolves or requires a 30-day month. 360-day year calendar for the prophecies to be fulfilled on time. We have the 1260 days, which are called three and a half years. That's only possible if you have this. So what's happened? Therefore, something occurred in our history that caused this to change. And I would argue that something will happen in the future to bring us back on time. Now, again, these are my thoughts uh, that I've kind of pulled and see what you think of it. Again, I'll back my case up. I can only think of three things that would cause this change. Three things, scripturally speaking. The first one is the flood itself, and this is what I used to think. This is what I used to think. The day the sun stood still, for Joshua, and the shadow moving back 12 steps for the sign of Hezekiah. It will say 12 degrees, but when you get into the Hebrew, it speaks of steps. And that his father, Ahaz, would have had a, a, a series of steps, and they would have gauged the, the time of day from that. But a bit like a huge sundial. They're the only three things I can think of that would do something. Because uh, it involves the sun, the moon, and the stars. These things, well, arguably the flood can, depending on how, what you think happened. Now, I used to think it was the flood back then. I've changed my opinion. I personally think it was the latter of these that caused the change, i.e. the shadow moving back 12 steps for the sign of Hezekiah. Again, I will give you my reasoning why. So let's look at history. Let's look at history, then we'll look at some scriptural things. What's interesting, so there's several civilizations, in fact, all the civilizations shared a similar calendar. All the religious Hindu texts speak of a 30-day month, 360-day year calendar, all of them. From approximately the 7th century BC, the Hindu year became 365 days long, but the 360-day year calendar was kept for their temple purposes, so they were actually running the two calendars side by side. And it meant that their uh, religious year fell back every so often. The ancient Persians had a 30-day month, 360-day year calendar. But from the 7th century BC, five supplementary days were added at the end of 12 months. So the way they thought of it was 12 months and then five days. Now, the months were lunar, by the way. In all these cases, the months are lunar and were judged from the first visible crescent. Here's a quote from the Bunda Hishna, which is a text sacred to the ancient Persians. It's actually uh, their creation account. It's part of their creation account. There are 180 apertures in the east and 180 in the west. And the sun every day comes in through an aperture and goes out an aperture, and it comes back to Varak, which is when the sun's done a complete cycle, in 360 days and five Gatha days. Now, Edward William West, he was a scholar and quite a few other things as well, but he translated the, the Bunda Hishna, and he commented on it as well, and he states this, Um, Gather days are five supplementary days added to the last of the 12 months of 30 days each to complete the year. For these days, no additional apertures are provided. So the sun comes in through one, goes out through another. This arrangement seems to indicate that the idea of apertures is older than the rectification of the calendar which added five gather days to an original year of 360 days. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. 
the old Babylonian year. That was 360 days long, the year being divided into 30-day months. However, again, in the 7th century BC, five days were added to the Babylonian calendar, these days being regarded as unpropitious, and the people, they, they basically, they were superstitious of them. Like, they were like, oh, five days. So they, they, they not venerated, but they, they're like, these days are different. The Assyrians had exactly the same calendar. Yet, however... There's no mention of a 360-day year to um, there's no mention of day year to a 365-day year. Okay, I'm, I've typed that wrong, but basically they had a 360 and they went to 365. But there's it was basically 360 plus five, but there's no record of when the change happened with the uh, Assyrians. There's no record. The Egyptians had the same calendar and had five days added to it sometime between the 8th and 7th centuries BC. So it spans now uh, within like 100 to 200 years. The Mayan year consisted of 360 days. Later, five days were added and the year was called a tune and five days. So the tune is the 360-day period. And then every four years, another day was added to the year. So that's your leap year thing. That's what all these, are, I didn't include this, but all the other civilizations did this. They'd add five days, and every fourth year, add another day. J.D. Acosta, an early writer on the Americas, states, they, rec they did reckon them apart. And they called them the days of nothing, during which the people did not do anything. So these days added on, the people called them the days of nothing. Friar Diego de Landa, in his Yucatan before and after the conquest, writes how they had a 365-day year, but that it was made up of lunar months. So already you can see the problem there, because lunar months uh, don't match up to 365 days. You get this surplus of five days. The five supplementary days were regarded as sinister and unlucky and were called days without name. Now, think of where in the world these kingdoms are. They're not just all in one place. They're spanning everywhere. The Incas of Peru had a 360-day year with 30-day months. Five days were added at the end of the year, which were called al Canquis, with an extra day being added every four years. Now, note that they're separating these days out from the 360 the Chinese had a 360-day year calendar, which was divided into 30-day months. But then they added five supplementary days called days over the year or days of nothing. And what's interesting is that they never, uh, they used to venerate the 360 day, they, they had a celebration around it that they used to have a 360-day year calendar. They didn't forget the idea. Please note that all these civilizations were known Oh, it's the wrong there. For their meticulous timekeeping and astronomical intelligence, especially the Babylonians and the Chinese, like they were ridiculously accurate. They could predict movements of stars for like hundreds and hundreds of years. And the Assyrians as well. I believe scripture shows other instances other than the flood and biblical prophecy where 360-day year was in operation. I, they're inferences. I'll, I'll grant you that. They're inferences. So here in Numbers 20, 29, it says that the congregation, when Aharon died, they wept for Aharon 30 days. Um, when Moses died, they were weeping and mourning 30 days until the days of mourning and weeping for Moses were completed. So 30 days. Now, this is interesting because in this passage, in Deuteronomy, when you go out to fight enemy against your enemies and Yah your Elohim shall give them into your hand and you shall take them captive and shall see among the captives a woman of fair form and shall delight in her and take her for your wife, uh, then you shall bring her to your home and to your house and sh she shall shave her head and trim her nails." Um, and put aside the mantle of her captivity and shall dwell in your house 
and mourn her father and mother a month of days. Now, the only other references I can find to a mourning period of a month of days is these two of Moses and Aaron. It says their time for mourning was completed after 30 days. So, I, again, it's an inference. But then that, this is what, one of the reasons I went from the flood being something where something went weird to Hezekiah, because this was happening after the flood. These passages show us that weeping for someone a month of days is to weep for them 30 days, if you put the passages together. Thus a month, I would argue, was considered 30 days. It's really interesting. You know in the, the, the calendar we have now where it's 29 point whatever days for a lunar month? When the month is 30 days, it's called complete. And when it's 29 days, it's called incomplete or lacking. Why? It's almost as if it used to be 30 days and now... Do you see what I'm trying to get at? The pattern that seems to emerge is that civilizations globally, lots of civilizations all around, had a 30-day month, 360-day year calendar. At some point, supplementary days started being added. At some point. Of the historical records that give us an indication of when this happened, all point to the 7th century, with one source pointing to somewhere between the 7th and the 8th. So that, that was the Egyptian sources. They, they were able to pull a couple of texts from the uh, Egyptians. It's this historical data that lends me to believe that a calendar change, and I don't mean a calendar change, but just that something happened to the heavenly bodies was due to the sign of Hezekiah, where the sun went back 12 steps. And again, I'll make my case. Hezekiah ruled... So he started co-regency with his father in 729 BC. That's your 8th century BC. That was the years of his soul rule. So on the cusp from the 8th to the 7th century BC is when he ruled alone. And then his son uh, took up after him, Manasseh. Six, nine, so, oh, I've done a typo. That's meant to be 687 BC, not 987 BC. <laughs> they were going back in time. <laughs> This takes us from the 8th century to the 7th century BC. Now, does that sound familiar with after what we've just covered? I know some people may actually struggle with the idea of the calendar being changed because it, it, what I'm suggesting is that something happened to the heavenly bodies by which we, we gauge time with, which, yeah, you know, the sun, moon and stars. This, uh, okay, I'm going to be honest, this... Who remembers the verse, I only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and we all went, my goodness, when was that put in there? This is another one of these verses where I was like, oh my goodness, this has always been there. Daniel 2. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, and Daniel blessed the Ella of the heavens. This is when he sees the vision of the, um, of the statue. Daniel responded and said, blessed be the name of Ella forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. And he removes and raises up sovereigns. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who possess understanding. Let verse 21 sink in. He changes the times and the seasons. What are times and seasons? Well, kind of feasts, but that, that's what I'm kind of hinting at. Well... Daniel was born roughly 100 to 120 years after the start of Hezekiah's sole regency. I'm giving it, people argue over the exact dates. So if anything happened in Hezekiah's time, it would have been pretty well known in the collective consciousness of the people. And Daniel's saying, yeah, who changes the time? I was like, oh my goodness. The implications to this are huge. Now, this is the word for time. So the, Daniel 2 is written in Aramaic. Now, Edan can be a year. It's, so when it says time, times, and half a time, it's this word. So it's not necessarily the, the Moedima changing, but the year changed. He who changes the time, the year. 
five supplementary days, well, five and a quarter. The other word was for appointed time was zaman, a set time, an appointed time, a season. Uh, so the Hebrew, it corresponds to, it's called zaman as well. Uh, idan corresponds to id, or no, ad. I think it's ad it corresponds to. So these are the Aramaic, but th this is Aramaic. But um, it, it's the same way of saying I have a, a scheduled appointment, I have a scheduled meeting, right? We use it. So zaman is also in the Hebrew, but it means the same thing as a moed. But this is why I was saying he's not changing when the Moedims occur in terms of day 15, day, you know, first month, seventh month. That doesn't change. But the year. I read it and I was like, oh my goodness. It's right there. Now, this is really interesting because in Isaiah 66, for as the new heavens and the new earth that I make stand before me, declares Yah, so your seed and your name shall stand. So this is the verse that's used, well, actually, the, the heavenly bodies can't be moved. Well, it just says that they can, st anyway, I'll get onto that. And it shall be, because have the new heavens and the new earth been made yet? No. And this is built on the new heavens and the new earth, that so your seed shall stand before me, not the current one which is really interesting. And it shall be that from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares Yah. So notice he's saying there'll be a new heavens and a new earth, and as they stand, so shall your seed stand. And then it mentions new moon to new moon and Sabbath. So again, timekeeping, keeping time. Now, what Emmanuel Velikovsky, this is where I got some of this stuff from. Um, he's got some pretty uh, far out ideas and he's also got some very good points to make. Uh, he was one of these scientists that the rest of science rejected because of his ideas. Um, not, I'm not saying everything he says is truth, but he makes some very interesting points. This is what he said about this passage. The new heavens means the sky with constellations or luminaries in new places. The prophet promises that the new sky will be everlasting and that the months will keep forever their established order. Now, who was Isaiah who wrote this? Who was he prophesying? Which king was around when he was prophesying? Hezekiah was one of the kings. So this means that if there was a change um, in the heavenly bodies, Isaiah would have known about it. Who better a person to prophesy, well, actually, one day, Yah's going to set it in place. Now, I want to bring this passage up, Joel 2. I shall give signs in the heavens and upon the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun is turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yah. So notice that the signs in the heavens happened before the awesome day of Yah, so before the end times. Could it be that this part of the signs in the heavens be a shifting back into a 30-day month, 360-day year calendar, thus allowing end time prophecies to occur on time? Because I, I believe, Yah, when Yah gives prophecy, he's so precise. I don't think it, you know what I mean? He's like, oh, well, it's about there. He does things on precision. So when, when I see that you need 360 day a year, 30 day months, we have to come there again. How? That means, li literally, something has to happen to the heavenly bodies. Do you think people will notice that? <laughs> Yah's the only one that would be able to do something like that as well. It's the one thing that is completely out of the reach of man, and I would say Hasatan. Only Yah has control of it. The way I liken it is that you have a clock face, and Yah just literally moved the minute's hand back a little bit. And then one day he'll go, okay, let's move it back. That, that's the way I'm, for an analogy, if that makes sense. These are my thoughts on Noah. 
They're just that, thoughts, things to ponder on, things to make you go, hmm, we're supposed to think, we're supposed to ponder, right? So I know today has been maybe a lot more left field than what I like to teach on, but sometimes we just have to go to these places. And uh, yeah, I hope it was thought-provoking. Amen?